Thanks for the opportunity to present today. Uh, those of you who've heard me speak before will know that one of my passions is safe, efficient structures. So making sure we do things safely, but also efficiently. Don't overdo things, don't underdo things. So hopefully today we'll um, provide some of that information. Uh, so today's presentation is on, let me just get, well, there we go, now we're moving properly. Um, 684 around tie downs. I understand that this is the third one and that some of you will have been to attend the previous two. Uh, including uh, bracing last time and uh, changes the time before that. I will still cover off the wind, on the wind classifications again, because just in case you didn't get there, I think that's probably one of the most important pieces is to understand the loads. So this is what we're going to talk about today. The scope of 684 is the same as the scope of 4055. So I'll cover that off briefly, just so you know when you're within and when you're without of the scope and what that ramifications might be. Quick review of some of the things that have changed in the 2021 version of AS4055, which is um, wind load for housing, which is called up in the NCC this year. So it's important to know what those changes are so you can action them accordingly. And then we're gonna get into a little bit of um, engineering stuff. So tight end formula, how you achieve that and how we then get the loads, which is the situation that you're in and then create the right solutions, which is the capacities of all the connectors and then a few interesting examples that I'll round off at the end just to um, just to highlight some of the problems that you can avoid by doing things correctly. So let's start with the scope. So in the same way, um, 684 sets up the scope, 4055 aligns, and it's around class one houses and class 10 buildings. It also is applicable without legal ramification for buildings and structures of a similar size and shape. But if you want to comply with the codes, in accordance with the NCC, these are the two classes that it covers. Um, the geometry hasn't changed from the previous version to this too much, a little bit of a change on height. So you'll notice that in the previous uh, version, which is on screen now, there's a overall height uh, that has been changed a little bit now to consider how retaining walls come into play. And again, the eight and a half meter height restraint is uh, constriction is the main restriction. There is some conversations happening as we speak around the scope of 684 and what that might look like going forward because the reality of the construction that is happening in uh, the marketplace today and the potential for it to change in future is starting to creep up on the slope, uh, on the scope rather, and particularly around the height of building where um, taller internal wall frames are now the, the norm. Most houses now are 2,600, if not 2,700 internal wall height. And when you add that together, put it on a slab and add a, um, a floor, can, floor level of eye joists or trusses, it doesn't take much to get the roof pitch outside of the scope of eight and a half meter tall. So we, we need to review that in light of what the current construction methodologies are like so that we do retain um, a useful deemed to satisfy document rather than one that is less common and therefore uh, need for more engineering involvement when it's not really necessary. So some changes to do with 4055 in the latest version. Uh, the overarching wind region that you're in is the starting point of all wind classification calculations. So are you in the majority of the country in region A or are you on the fringes around regions B, C and um, D if you happen to live in the far northwest of the, Australia, of the Australian continent. The major change you can see on screen there is that the region B around Brisbane has been deepened inland. So instead of it being a 100 kilometre limit, it's now two. Uh, the extent of it is still no different. It's still the 25 degrees down to 30 degrees latitude, but the depth into the, uh, into the country has changed. There are ongoing discussions around 1170 and 4055 as we see the effects of um, cyclones coming into areas they've never come into before and some more robust uh, analysis of the results of cyclones and what that uh, is occurring inland. For example, in, I'll just change this pointer to be a laser. In this region here on the west of the country, in region B, uh, cyclone Saroja came through here. Now, we understand that cyclones aren't allowed to come into Region B, but they did. So there's, there's ongoing discussions now about what does Region B, C and D look like. Um, there's been some analysis by uh, Dr. Jeff Borton around windborne debris and the previous concept that windborne debris is in a cyclonic uh, circumstance and 
the gust in the other circumstances, region A and region B, is really been around thunderstorms. So thunderstorms, you get really quick gusts intermittently, but you don't generally have that combined with debris, whereas in a cyclonic sort of circumstance, you are going to get both. Now, recent uh, analysis has found that there has been a fair bit of debris even into region B, and discussions are still in train about what that will do for internal pressure coefficients going forward. So at the moment, uh, pretty much status quo. However, we do have a couple of changes of region uh, that you'll note if you happen to live in those areas of the country, which as you can see, is only one very small part of a very large continent. The next consideration as you determine wind classification for your particular site is where are you locally? What, what's the, the local um, circumstance within which your building is constructed? Are you in wide open spaces? Are you in the middle of suburbia? And that have, therefore has an effect on the wind impact on your particular structure and therefore the design you have to deal with. There was a previous classification of one and a half, which was introduced in uh, 2012, which has now been removed. So there used to be a one, a one and a half and a two, and now we've gone back to a terrain category one and a terrain category two. So that distinction has been removed going forward. It is also uh, a little note you'll find around clumps of trees, uh, which was just to define that a clump of tree isn't um, a median strip worth of two trees. It has to be at least equivalent to a house. So just making it very clear what the, the code meant when it's was saying there's clumps of trees which are impacting the wind classification for your area. By far the largest change in 4055 is the change to topographic classification. So previously it was fairly simple, lower third, middle third, upper third, and the slope of the hill was the impact. Now there is much more definition around how you get to the slope that you're gonna then put in the table. Uh, and the table now looks like this. So previously table 2.3, you had a slope, a lower middle or upper area, and then the height of the hill. And you also had an overtop zone that said, once you pass the hill, um, what does that mean? In the latest version, 4055 2021, that over the top um, consideration is now gone. Basically it says that once you pass a certain distance, you're not on a hill at all. So there's no reason to have an over the top distance. It's just not on a hill. And again, you still use the same slope, you still use the same upper and lower third, but determining this slope is now done much more accurately using these methodologies. And that's the, that will be the, the largest change for most people is to understand this distance near a structure uh, in your zone of about 200 meters, what does that mean for the slope determination in the direction of the wind? The net result of all that, change in the wind regions, change in topographic classifications, you end up back at the same table in 4055 that you always did. So where are you in Australia? What's your local terrain category? And then how much hill slope are you on across the top, the T-series? And then the last one is your full shielding, partial shielding or no shielding. Now I've circled on this screen, the changes between 2020, the letter 2021 and the previous version. And what I've put in green is those areas that have changed and they've changed down by a value. So previously, this one, for instance, in region A, terrain category one, um, in topographic zero and partial shielding, that used to be N1. It's now dropped down to N2. So you'll find that these changes, sorry, it used to be N3 rather, now dropped down to N2. So these changes have all made those sites, those particular ones there, and there's not very many of them, slightly less onerous to design for. Not such an easy story in cyclonic regions. So in cyclonic regions, there's been an additional concept added, which is a distance to a smooth boundary. So the coastline or a higher wind region. And that distance value you can see on screen here is, this, is the value in brackets. So you'll find, for instance, this one here that I've circled um, in that region C terrain category three, there's a C2 if you're between zero and 10 kilometers, or a C1 if you're between 10 and 50 kilometers from the coast, still within that region C. So this isn't taking into consideration you move from C down to B, it's all within that strip that is region C. Now I haven't put circles around all the changes because I started and realized that it was gonna be much more comprehensive and this would have looked like a neon sign. So as an example, uh, in some cases they've gone up, in some cases they've gone down. 
and it always depends on your proximity to the coastline. So this particular one here, um, previously that was all C2, sorry, all C1 rather, but now if you're between that zero to 10 kilometer section, that particular piece has jumped up to C2. So you're now getting your zone split by this um, distance figure that you need to take into consideration. So both of these, um, non-cyclonic and cyclonic, the net result at the end of that whole process is to come up with a wind classification of an N or a C rating, one, two, three, or four. So what does that actually mean? When I get to my N1, N2, N3, N4, that's all well and good to say, but just to give you some perspective around what that means in terms of the probable maximum wind of your design storm, you end up with engineering sort of numbers, which are meters per second, which don't help, or you end up with Bureau of Meteorology numbers, which are much more able to be consumed because that's what the, um, the national news says at the end of the day. So your probable maximum storm, your major event that you have the design for in uh, an N1 rating means that when that major storm hits the area, if your particular structure is in an N1 rated zone, the load that you are expected to be taking account of is 122 kilometers per hour. So this isn't a series of different storms. This is the major storm and just the exposure of this particular site and by the zone of N1 to N4. So you'll find that in an N4 rated zone, we're talking about 220 kilometers an hour, pretty much no obstructions in the way you're gonna cop the full blast of the wind. And that's the pressures that you end up designing to. You note that in cyclonic regions, those numbers start around the same number. So you know that C1 and C2, 180 and 220, are the same as N3 and N4. And the difference between the C and the N is purely to do with the internal pressure coefficient. That concept I was talking before about the, um, the wind-borne debris, which will potentially puncture the fabric of the building and provide, provide a large opening for a pump up effect inside, which increases the pressure, increases the uplift inside the structure, and therefore increases the need for tie downs and bracing. So just as a, a reminder, when you're in a wind event at home, uh, for those in the non-cyclonic areas, you'll notice a pressure build up inside your building. You hear the building creak a little bit. You might even feel your ears pop. That's that leakage around the the underneath the doors, around windows, where the wind does get into the building and does pump it up a little bit. While you're in a non-penetrated building, that internal pressure coefficient is fairly low, about 20% of the pressure on the building. However, if one of those openings is breached and you have a large wind opening, uh, whether a window or a garage door, something breaches, then you end up with a pump-up effect internally of much higher, uh, something around 70% of the wind pressure starts to lift up from the inside as well as running over the top of the building on the outside. The aim of going through 4055 and creating a wind classification is to get you to the starting point of your tie-down and your bracing calculations. So what are we going to talk about with tie-down? What is it that we're trying to achieve? We're trying to connect the building to the ground. Uh, the easiest way to think of that is as a chain. So the wind is going to apply a load at the top of the chain and the bottom of the chain needs to be attached to the ground sufficiently such that at no point on that chain is there a breakage. And you'll see on the right-hand side that starts right at the roof material. That's where the load's applied. The roof has to be tied to the battens, the battens to the rafters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down through your first story into your second story if you have two stories, all the way down to the slab at the ground. Now, as you get deeper and deeper into the building, you have more and more overburden. So uh, by that, I mean, if you connected this building together properly, by the time you get to the ground floor joist and slab, the wind pressure has to lift the whole building off the ground. So the requirements for tie downs as you get deeper into the building become less onerous. However, they're still required. You wanna make sure that at no point in that chain, you end up with a paperclip because that weak point becomes the place that the building will let go. And there's been evidence of a number of those circumstances over the past couple of years. And I'll throw some up on screen when we get towards the end. So to deal with this chain of links and how we're gonna do that as a tie down calculation, at every connection point, we need to know the right fixing. So the right connection at each point will then make sure the chain is continuous all the way down to the bottom. Now in an engineering 
sense. That means I need a load, which is expressed in kilonewtons, and I need a capacity of a connector and make sure the capacity is higher than the loads being applied. And then you end up with no paper clips. So before we go on to doing that calculation, just a quick level set, bit of perspective around what the loads are. So when engineers talk about loads, we talk about dead loads and live loads. A dead load is pretty much a permanent load. In other words, if you left the building and moved out and moved to another building, what do you leave behind? So the structure, the major linings with the roof material, the ceiling material, the floor material, et cetera, they're counted as dead loads. They're permanently as part of the building. Live loads are temporary loads, things that come and go. Now, um, there are live loads which are living, such as you and I. When we walk into a building and walk onto a floor, we're a live load. That's not because we're living, it's just because we're there temporarily. When we leave, leave home, whatever, we're no longer applying a load to the structure. So they are temporary loads or short-term loads. And there are special live loads. So a special live load, temporary load, one of them is wind, another is snow, uh, another is seismic. They're live loads that are there in the life of the structure very briefly. Why is that relevant to timber design? In Timber has a unique capacity to contain a load or to resist a load, uh, different to any other material. It is very, very good at short-term load by comparison to its ability to carry a long-term load. As an example, it's roughly 50% in dead load compared to wind load. So an instantaneous load, it can take twice as much as an instantaneous load in the same direction as it could take as a permanent load. So for timber design, and that's applicable to the structural design of it, as well as it is applied to the connections that are applied to them, so nails, screws, et cetera, knowing what the load is and what the duration of the load as a live load is very important. So we do distinguish between dead loads and live loads. We're talking today about wind loads, which are a live load, which are counted as being that instantaneous gust suddenly applied to a structure. And then we use engineering terms like kilonewtons and kilopascals. I find it helpful for people to understand what they are because it gives you a, an ability to visualize. In the same way that an N1 rating is 122 kilometer hour wind, it allows you to visualize what that might feel like. I mean, you could drive down the road at 110 kilometers legally and you put your hand out the window. That's the wind that's applied at 110 kilometers to your building. Imagine 120 or 160 or 180 or 220. When you see those numbers and you apply them to your N1, N2, N3, N4, or C1, C2, C3, C4, you get a perspective then as to what that event on your structure will look like. It's very much the same in terms of kilonewtons and kilopascals. Um, if an engineer says that's a 10 kilonewton tie down point, that's just a number, unless you have a bit of concept. So let's start with kilonewtons. The easiest way to remember a kilonewton, it's the, the load applied by one large person. One large guy standing on a floor applies one kilonewton of force downwards. Or another way to think about it is 10 kilonewtons is one small car. So you have a 10 kilonewton load applied to a, a point in your structure that's supporting a small car. In the concept of wind uplift, all those numbers are reversed into upwards loads rather than downward loads. Again, to help you potentially vision that, think of the building turned upside down and now it's hanging from the ground as opposed to the wind lifting it up. And think about dangling things off each of those connection points of that sort of scale. So if I have a one kilonewton tie down, that's like turn it upside down, hang a person off that point. Two kilonewtons, two people. 10 kilonewtons uplift at the end of that girder truss. That's like upside down, hanging a small car off that point. When you have those images in your mind, it allows you to think more clearly about paper clips. Where is it potentially, if I turn this building upside down and apply a load to it, where are those links in the chain going to let go? Where are the places that don't seem to be covered well enough to make sure this building is going to stay together? The second term that we use regularly is kilopascals. Uh, we'll come to why we talk about kilopascals a little bit later on. But again, just for perspective, one kilopascal is an area load. It's a load applied by one large guy over one square metre. So... In the case of a balcony, for instance, when we talk about live loads for a balcony, a two KPA live load is the equivalent to having two people, two large people per square meter for the whole of that balcony. 
So when we start talking about kilopascals, imagine that sort of load, the pressure applied by one large person per square meter is just one kPa. So when things go to two, three, four, five, et cetera, again, that gives you a picture that you can, you can envisage. Uh, when you're designing mid floor, for instance, in commercial structures, and you might have a five kPa live load because it's a storage room, that's equivalent to five people per square meter over the whole area of the floor. So it's a fairly significant load and much easier to imagine. So how do we gonna get this load that we're gonna have applied to the building? How do we find each of the connection points and find out what kilonewton load is applied at each of those points? Let's start with the easy way. Avoiding maths is always the best way to go. Let's, let's try not to do maths as much as possible. So the first step is check table 9.2. Do I need to pick up a calculator or a pen and pencil at all? And you'll see that I'll start with your N1, 2, 3, and 4 area. Uh, and I'll stay in that zone mostly because I'm going to look at 1684 part 2, but they have exactly the same tables in part 3 as well. Depending on how far down the building you are, from the roof battens down through to the ground, depends on how much load is applied from above. If you find your position in the building you're checking, the connection linkage that you're checking has an S at that point, that means you need a specific connection. Go and find a calculator. If it has an N at that point, that means it's a nominal fixing, no calculation required. So you'll see that by the time you get to the lower floor of a two-story construction in N1, N2, and N3, regardless of sheet, tile, roof, you only have nominal fixings required at the base. And that makes sense because you have a two-story building fully lined, all sitting above it, resisting the wind lifting it up. So if you have nominal fixings, there's another table of nominal fixings. Now, I'm not going to go through every one of these fixings, but each one of our connection points, each one of those links in the chains is defined in this table, and you get a minimum fixing required at that point to make sure you have a solid connection at that point. So if you're within this table 9.2, I haven't picked up a calculator, I haven't gone to any fancy tables, and I can see all that is required to comply with the requirements of the code in this one table. Let's say, for instance, though, you might end up in an S area where you do have to do a specific connection. What do you have to do then? Well, then there is a little bit of maths. There's a light way, and then there's the lots of maths way. Let's start with the easy way. There's a series of tables within 1684 that allow you to come up with a kilonewton value, and you'll see that that's what it says at the top of the page, uplift force in kilonewtons, this is our load. At each of these locations, so we're looking at this one as a raft or a truss, so this is like the tail of a truss, based on an upload lift, an uplift load width, a fixing spacing, and then where you are in the building, you're either nominal, which we shouldn't have been here anyway, because we found that in the other table, or you have a number of kilonewtons of tie down. So the, the bigger the load, the further apart the spacing, the higher the force being applied. Way down here at a four and a half meter uplift load width, if your spacing was every three meters apart, so you have trusses at three meter centers, which is very unusual, you'll end up in N2 needing that 10 kilonewtons worth of tie down at each point of uplift. A note here, you can interpolate. In other words, you can go between these numbers, but you can't extrapolate. You can't use this table to say, um, this table actually goes up to seven and a half meters if you go down far enough. You can't then go beyond the limit of the table and say, well, it's, it's a line and that line is straight. And if I go up to a much, much higher uplift load width, I can still do the same calculation. Or I got my fixing spacing, not at three meters, but they're at four and a half meter spacing. Within the table, you're fine. You can interpolate between the two. So for instance, if I was in this uplift load width of one and a half meters and my fixing spacing was somewhere between 1.8 and three, I could then interpolate between these two numbers. So if it was halfway between there, it's halfway between these two numbers. So that's a little bit of math that you could do. If you're in between, you can use an in-between value. It gets more complicated, obviously, if you're in between your uplift load widths and your fixing space, you've got to interpolate twice. So what is uplift load width? What is ULW? The uplift load width is the halfway to halfway between tie downs. So you have a tie down point, a tie down point, and then halfway from that one to halfway from that one, that's my uplift load width for this connection. So look carefully at the trust one at the bottom. Up the top, it makes sense, very simple. The trust spans from here to here. So my uplift load width is halfway to my extreme, 
to my next uplift position and that gives me uplift low width for this point. But look at the ground. Even though I have support points in the middle, they're not getting any uplift. So my uplift load width is still halfway from here to the middle and from the middle halfway to this one. So that's my uplift load width there. So it's not always every time there's a connection halfway to halfway, it's every time there's an uplift connection halfway to halfway. Okay, so I hope that makes that clear. You'll see in the load example for a coupled roof, because my struts are connected all the way down, now my distances from my tower down points are halfway between, halfway between. If I don't have a strutted roof such as this, now my distances from here to here, that's my uplift load width from middle of building to extreme edge. If you wanna really get into the maths or you need to because you're in an area where extrapolation doesn't work or the extrapolation is too complex, you then do a proper engineering calculation, which is pressure times area. Pressure, KPA, as we spoke over before. One and a half men per square meters, one and a half large person per square meters, 1.44. That's a pressure figure. And the, the engineering formula is the force that you need, the kilonewtons you need, is the pressure, multiply the area over which that's applied. So think about if I have uh, one large person every square meter and I have a support point under every person, then the support required is one kilonewton because it's the area that's being applied a meter and the pressure being applied from above. If my area that is being supported is larger, then obviously my force goes up. So for my pressure calculation, which is this KPA, and then my wing classification, and then I know, need to know which layer of the building I'm in. So again, the lower down you get into the building, there is no requirement for an uplift pressure because this is net uplift. So in other words, the wind uplift minus the dead load of the building holding everything into position. So again, you get to the lower floor of two stories and all the way up to N3, I don't have to worry about it. Nominal fixing only. There is no value to worry about. This little box here in gray recognizes that when we get into the upper classifications, there's uh, a potential for overturning force that when the wind blows on the side of the building, it wants to rotate the building over and you get an uplift from overturning force. And that's these numbers here. All you have to worry about though, 1.42, 2.92, whatever that number happens to be, that's your pressure. So I have part one of my calculation. How do I get to part two? Part two is my area. And the area is the spacing times uplift load width. So imagine in plan view, I have this truss roof here. I have a truss every say 600. Then my spacing is 600. That's the strip width. And the uplift load width is how far is it from the overhang to the ridge in plan. Okay, so remember that's always in plan view. So it's much more accurate to do, but it does take longer to do all those calculations to work it out. So three ways of getting the load. So step one is to get the load. All right, so I have the load, great. And I simply have to match the capacity of every connection to the right load that I'm having applied. So in this particular case of a stud to a top plate, I have a load, I come to my table and I go, oh, hang on a second. There's multitudes of capacities based on this joint group value. So I need another piece of information to do my calculation. I need to know the joint group that I'm attaching it to. And again, that's one of those things that you just know intuitively. If you nail a nail into a piece of uh, hardwood, a piece of eucalypt, A, it takes more force to put the nail in, B, it takes more force to get the nail back out again. If you nail a nail into a piece of uh, light imported softwood, easy to get in, easy to get out. So I need my joint group to then determine what my actual capacity of each connection is. So how do we get the joint group? Table 9.15 gives you a series of joint groups buried in 1684. And it's the most common materials being used. You'll find your hardwoods, you'll find your softwoods, and you'll find some imported products. Um, two species that are brought into the country at the moment have a, a little bit of an unhelpful naming convention. There's a white Baltic and there's a red Baltic. The white Baltic is usually a spruce, whereas a red Baltic is usually a Scots pine. If you want to get into the fancy um, Latin names, Picia albis versus Pinus sylvestris. They're all conifers. They're all part of the, the pine tree family, but they grow at different rates and they have different densities. And you'll see that you have Scots pine noted here in the code as Baltic, not even with the red or the white, comes in at JD5 or spruce pine fir, SPF, uh, as they call it in the US, comes in at JD6. 
if in doubt, so if you're not a, a wood scientist and you don't know what the what the material is that you're dealing with, but you know that it's not radiata pine, the most common material you would normally get, simply go to the unidentified row. So softwood imported unidentified becomes JD6. You could go all the way into table G2. Don't try and read that screen, it's much too complicated. If you wanna be really precise and you knew exactly the species it came from, you could use this table to find that information out to get exactly the right joint group to use. But as I said before, most of us aren't wood scientists and um, a piece of pine cut into 90 by 35s or 90 by 45s is not always easily distinguishable. So pretty much easy to stay with your JD4, JD5, JD6. So now I have my joint group nearly enough. I now need to know which element is governing my capacity. So there's a little table here again of common sense that says if I'm attaching a batten, is it the joint group here or the joint group here that matters? Which joint group is the one that actually governs? An example up here, you see a strap where the strap is nailed to a beam. The nails are in this piece of timber. So the joint group here makes is the one that is the one that governs. So again, use this figure, use some common sense. Uh, you've got to nail this into a member, then it's going to be the lowest of these two because you could have pull through in the baton or you could have withdrawal from the from the base. Um, one of these connections, same thing again, nails in this one, nails in that one. Pick the lower joint group. Right, we're back to our table again. We're nearly there. We've now got a capacity, a lot, sorry, a load that's needed we've done a calculation on. We now know the joint group. Now all we have to do is come down to our little table and say, all right, so I'm in this particular connection point in my chain. I have a load required of, let's say it's five. I can come down to my column, let's say I'm in JD5 here, and I can say, I need a four nailed strap, gets me 4.9. Okay, well, that's, that's just under my five, so I'll need to go to a six nailed strap. If you're in that situation though, this is one of those places where you can do a little bit of a recalc. So it says I needed five, but I got 4.9, or uh, say I needed five and a half would be a better example. That five and a half, remember, was based on a particular spacing. Is it possible that I could bring the spacing down lower, therefore reduce the load, and therefore use a cheaper connector? And this is where you can do a little back and forwards. You can go backwards to your calculation of your uplift load width, and instead of it being at, say, 1.2 centres, do it at 0.6 centres. Whatever the spacing is determines the amount of load that's being applied. So you can go back and forwards between the two tables to come up with an efficient design. You end up with that design circumstance where you're getting a safe and efficient result for your structure. And you do this process at every link in the chain from the top to the bottom, all the way down. So each point, you calculate the load, check against the capacity and get each of those connections exactly right. Your aim at the end of the day is not to have any paper clips. Now there's been some amendments to 1684 later version, which has gotten rid of some old paper clips. One of the considerations was how do I connect my upper floor to my lower floor without having to go the knee joints connect to the chin bone, connect to the ankle bone, connect to the toe bone, all the way down and have one, two, three, four, five connections. Is there a way of bypassing that whole circumstance and tie my upper floor directly to my lower floor? The answer is yes, of course there is. You can put a strap around the outside. So this is now defined in the code to say, this is a circumstance you can now add into your list of chain links and calculate the correct loading at that point. Another paper clip that's existed for a long time is masonry. So for, for those in parts of the country that use timber framing onto masonry, there's often been a disconnect between those two industries, who's responsible for, for determining that particular connection. Those connections have now been brought into 1684 to make it easy. So for those that are doing timber to masonry connections, uh, there are now three new details that have been brought into 1684 that allow you to do that same calculation. You still get your same load. You apply that load to a capacity of a connection. And on your way down the building, when you hit that point, um, for those doing the timber design, you can then get the correct capacity for the right connection going down into the frame. And so you'll have a top plate to a strap, a beam to a strap, and then the full height 
um, connection of a batten. A very common methodology in the areas around Perth is to tie your battens down. So you tie your batten, which holds your truss down or your rafter down, and you bypass the need to have extra connections from this point to this point, this point to this point. You can tie that directly down and sandwich the load down and connect it to the masonry. Now, it does require you to go to the masonry code to make sure that that connection is done properly. So a little bit of coordination between the bricklayers and the carpenters to make sure that that strap is in place as the masonry is poured. So that when it comes to time to apply your timber framing on top, that that strap is connected well and ready to go to be connected in. But again, that paper clip used to exist. Uh, now it's been clarified in 684 to make that easier. Another one was um, the introduction or the need rather for a much deeper batten as um, roof loads have gone up and spacing between rafters have gone up, timber materials have changed. Uh, much more common now use a 45 millimeter batten. The result of using a 45 millimeter batten is that the penetration into the member that's doing the tying down reduces as this gets deeper. So for the same length screw or nail, as the batten gets deeper and deeper and deeper, there's less penetration into the receiving member. So again, the use of 45 mil battens wasn't in the code previously, now it is. That allows you to do that um, comparison again to the load required and the capacity that you need to achieve. So here's a few examples of some paper clips just to whet your interest around the depth of the building about getting your chain right. If you're failing to connect in right at the top edge of the building, you will lose your iron, potentially your battens. Um, if you allow that connection point to be much lower in the building, in other words, you don't pay attention once you get past a certain point and you introduce a paper clip at this sort of level, you can lose a whole roof. And there's been examples of those in the past. So remember, your load has to be correct all the way from the top, all the way to the bottom, every single point of linkage. Another paperclip, for, for want of a better term, is to make sure your fixings are done correctly. Now, all product manufacturers provide details about how those products are to be fixed, whether they're screwed, whether they're nailed, whatever the methodology is. The reason that is best to be followed is simply to avoid risk. If a manufacturer has said, do X, and you decide that X is too hard, so you'll just do Y, if there is a problem in future, the manufacturer gets to say, not my problem, sir. I said, fix it this way. You decide to do it a different way. So you're better off always to follow the manufacturer's specifications because that means that the risk is all back on the manufacturer. They said to do it that way. If it doesn't perform, that all falls on them. So follow manufacturer's instructions and that way you can avoid risk for yourself and for your client. And lastly, I'm going to put three photos up on screen here for you to look at. I'm going to stay silent for about 30 seconds. I want you to picture in your mind in those buildings where the paper clips exist. And then I'll come back and I'll tell you where I can see them. Okay, that's probably long enough. Let's start on the left-hand side. I have my roof framing material attached to my top plate, which is then attached to not a lot. If I had connected it sufficiently to this lintel, that lintel is then attached to not a lot. So this continuous load path needs to go all the way down to the ground and each connection point needs to follow it down. Probably this one is a little bit more glaringly obvious. I have a girder truss, which is needing two framing anchors to connect it to the top plate. But what connects the top plate to the stud that's supporting it? A couple of nails down through the top plate into end grain. Very good example of high capacity, no capacity. Read paperclip. And this one catches people regularly. I have a very long beam, big steel beam designed to take the load both vertically uh, downwards and vertically upwards in a wind event. So it's a significant steel beam, uh, a dwarf wall on top and the framing work applied to the top of that. All that framing work is very effectively attached to this little dwarf wall section that's applied to the top of it but that's as far as the connections go. There's a couple of burst nails that have been nailing this top plate down this steel beam. There's no connection between this top plate stud and the bottom plate. So should the load get applied to these trusses across the top, there is no continuity of connection down to the steel beam that's designed to be taking that load. So hence a paper clip in the chain. 
So what have we covered today? Just reviewed 680, uh, sorry, 4055 and 684 scope, a bit of a, a revisit of the wind classification changes that are in 2021 version. We've dealt with the tight end formula, which is pressure times area, and then worked out how to get the loads. So the situation of loads, do you use maths? Do you use some maths? Do you use no maths? Once you have a load, how do I get the capacities at those load at each point? With the end goal being that I've created a building with no paper clips. So should the design wind event occur and it gets applied to your building, it all stays together and everyone is safe and we have a safe, efficient design. Thank you. I'll let you have the screen back, Boris. No worries, thanks. Thanks, Tim. So um, I suppose yeah, we've got just got a, a, a couple of um, questions there. So can you see that, Tim? Um, it's assumed that most of our fixing, including gainers, are fixed in a JD4 at a moisture content of about 12%. In a previous webinar, we discussed the effect of moisture take up of about 18% due to extreme rainfall or exposed framing. Generally, the builders are not allowing enough time for framing to dry out prior to close up. What could be the long term effect of this connection or durability? Yeah. It really comes down to time and risk. Um, the, the timber will dry out. It will reduce back down to its natural moisture content of 12%. That will occur. The question is how fast does it occur once it's had a, a, an extreme weather event? It's a bit of a, anyone's guess is as good as mine. Wind events happen very rarely. Well, they're supposed to happen very rarely. We've had a bit of a nasty run of late, but over the long term, they're supposed to happen fairly rarely. Uh, and the expectation is that the timber will be back to a natural moisture content at the time that you get that rare event occurring. And that's the only way we, we have designed in the past. There's been no push to change that in the future to say we need to assume that the joint grip has dropped a notch because of that moisture content increase. So at the moment, there's no requirement to do that. Um, I don't see any, any of that coming forward in, certainly in the standards discussions that I've seen uh, recently about changing that requirement. Yeah, yeah um, just on another thing, uh, Tim, yeah, you sort of gave us some uh, visuals about things that, aren't, that can go wrong on site, but are there some, from your, your experience, obviously in the uh, trust and frame sector, is there some sort of typical things that people aren't doing correctly? I know you're sort of talking about the paper clips, but are there some sort of things that you just see over and over again that, that you know, should be done uh, better or should be done at all? Often when it gets into the framing, people, people have become very good at connecting most of the roof material together. Attention gets a little bit lesser once you get down into the frames themselves. Um, not terribly poor in a prefabricated frame yeah. but often in site constructed frames that's one of the gaps that occurs and often it's around not the um the carpenters involved or the or the installers involved not knowing where the roof uplifts are going to be and how to apply them so that has a tendency to be the first paper clip is in that wall frame material itself and those connections of top plate to stud um bottom plate to stud that, that's where you see most of them. Certainly around openings is the other place that I get to see many of those shortcomings. So you have a well tied down series of framing that stops at the lintel, but then the lintel isn't tied down beyond that very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've had a, a couple more questions, uh, Tim. So in relation to screw fixings, you know, we sort of see them overseas, you know, we're you know, tying of, you know, from underneath through uh, top plates into the underside of of roof trusses is, is that sort of being something um, looking to come into the Australian market? Yeah, yeah. There's um, there's a certainly a, a move towards screws in the Australian market, and all of all the major suppliers, um, MyTech, Prider, Multinail, and Simpson, and others are bringing screws to the marketplace for exactly that reason. Yeah, they're they're uh, a more robust connection than a nail, uh, and they are generally faster to fit than a, a bracketed connection. There's a few. Be carefuls that come with those things. Uh, one of those is that once a screw's in the timber, you can't really tell what's buried. And, and that's been one of the biggest gripes of the building inspector part of the regime is to say, well, that's all well and good to say that it's supposed to be a screw X long, but how do I tell it's A, the right screw, B, the right length, C, it's been put in the right application. So there is some more care that's required. And that it sort of goes against the grain of, I've got a faster connection now, so I can put it in quicker but you have to be more careful. So it is a buyer beware. You can use screws, 
They're perfectly viable. Be careful installing them. Use the right ones in the right places. And again, back to what I said before, follow the manufacturer's specifications. The manufacturer says you need to do X. If you don't and something goes wrong, that's back on you. So if the manufacturer says that the screw has to be placed in a particular way at a particular angle with a particular edge distance, and you decide that or don't even notice that you didn't comply with that, well, should something go pear-shaped, then that falls back on the installer and eventually onto the builder that's had the installer do the work. Yeah. And, and look, I suppose at the moment, we don't have 1684 having that type of connector in there. So you do need to follow the, the manufacturer um, yep. and provide the, the appropriate documentation to the building surveyor or certifier um, uh, to enable that connector to be used. So it's probably something, Tim, that 1684 should consider um, in future revisions. Yeah, I think it would be worthwhile considering in future revisions. The, the science of screw design is um, surprisingly sophisticated. And a screw is a screw is a screw is certainly not the case, whereas a nail is a nail is a nail is pretty much the case. So right. it'll be interesting to see how the, how the standards do cover that in the future rather than standardizing the screw that allows the screw manufacturers to, to put their own special smarts and IP into their products. Um, we'll yeah. see how that pans out in the long run. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a, a question has been uh, asked of um, about the, the appropriate level of documentation, Tim, uh, that should be provided. And so I suppose to quote the, the question, um, you know, how much can you trust the knowledge of the framing uh, carpenter? Yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I would start with table 9.2. So if you're in table 9.2 and you have nominal fixing, you're fairly safe ground. When you get outside of table 9.2 and you have to, have to doing specifics, then you're really going to need to start chasing down whether those applications have been done correctly. Uh, the trust and knowledge of the framing carpenter, um, yeah, the, some of the old heads have left the industry and um, some of the new heads haven't yet caught up. I'm finding in recent times, things that I thought were known have stopped being known. So I'm, some of these education systems, such as what um, Wood Solutions is doing, are essential to that process to make sure that some of the, uh, the newer heads coming in learn things that have been assumed to be known by some of us older heads. Right. So yeah. trust, is, trust is a good thing to put in inverted commas. <laughs> Um, a question about the, I suppose it's the connector capacities and you know, is there, uh, the question is sort of phrased, you know, is there, um, are, are the standards, are they limit state or is there a safety margin uh, in the connectors? They are as to be applied. So you work out four kilonewtons, it's four. The safety margin is built into the number. And so the calculations all have a safety margin within them. The safety margins are as required by the codes. So it doesn't give you a get out of jail free card to say, oh, the safety margin, so I don't have to worry about it so much. The safety okay. margin itself is as required by the code. Uh, a very good example of that in recent times was the change of the safety margin for just dead loads being applied to a structure. So the load of roof material on a structure um, was 25% higher as a safety margin. So you've got 100 kilonewtons of load. We had to design for 125. Uh, at some point, the industry, um, sorry, the, the technologists that decide on these sort of um, safety margins decide 25 wasn't high enough and it should be 35. Didn't okay. change the load being applied, but it certainly changed the amount of effort we had to put into designing things and the strength of materials to handle the extra 35% of safety margin. Doesn't mean that we can get away with the old 25% we are bound by the codes to put the safety margins in that have been specified. So yes, there's safety margins, um, but we still have to abide by them. Mm. Yeah, there's a, a, another question, uh, Tim, in relation to, you know, should there be some sort of standardised listing of, of the connections from, you know, from roof down to, to slab? I would suggest that table 9.4 pretty much gives you that. All those nominal fixings gives you all those connections from top down to bottom. Mm. There are nuances with that, obviously. So some buildings won't have as many openings as other buildings. Some areas are single story. But if you go through table 9.4, that covers all the standard connections from top through to the bottom. And, and I think the other thing too, Tim, you know, trying to give some standardised approaches is that houses are different. You know, so to have the same you know, uplift load with, you know, you're know, going to have just go down one, one section of the tables and you won't pick up all the various variations that can occur uh, on that's, site. So that's, that's exactly right. It's always a difficulty with deemed to satisfy type stuff is to you know try and give it a very sim simple pathway. It'd be really great, but it's not always that easy to do. 
Um, yeah, we need to have a long conversation with architects about making pretty buildings. <laughs> well, we, we could all live in the same sized house and it would be simple. <laughs> so, um, look, I suppose one of the other things too, Tim, um, you know, one of the things that gets raised is about reliability um, of, of connections and like how, how do our standards keep up with things? And I suppose I'm thinking like the, the work that done that's done post-event where people look at, you know, how connections have performed and then and then how that feeds into the process of standards review. So, um, you know, maybe if, you, if you've got some sort of comment along those yeah. lines. It, there's certainly forensic work that's done after wind events, um, either through um, the uni at um, James Cook. Um, often people like Jeff, Dr. Jeff Borton get involved and they follow up on an event, find out where things have let go. To date, and it happens internationally, so you'll find that happens after every hurricane and major wind event. What we're finding most of the time is that it's a miscalculation of load, not a miscalculation of capacity that becomes a problem. That the capacity of the unit itself to tie down is perfect, but the, um, the load that's being applied is higher than was expected. So it, generally, it's around the definition of the load as opposed to the capacity of the unit. When I have no record of any circumstance where the unit itself can't hold the load it was supposed to, um, apart from poorly fixed or incorrectly yeah. fixed items. But if it's the right thing for the right load, the issue has been that the loads ended up being wrong. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's this we'll... discussion around now about the region B and region C and internal pressure coefficients. Have we got the loading right? Is the right load being applied at each point? Yeah. Look, and I must say, I mean, you know, companies do a whole lot of testing work with the various connectors as well to, to confirm performance yep. and looking at changes in material properties uh, I know in the previous uh, webinar, we talked about um, with the bracing capacities and how you know, the resources change slightly. So the joint group for bracing has dropped from JD4 down to JD5. Um, so that, that sort of material impacts, but the connectors, a connector is connector. You can determine its capacity based on testing. And yep. if anything changes within that um, equation, um, it's not going to be the connector. It's going to be, the, like you say, the design, the loads, you know, all that sort of stuff, they'll have a, a big impact. And you'll find that all the major manufacturers, um, certainly locally, uh, who are reputable manufacturers, will keep up with ongoing testing. There's a requirement to continue to test as materials change. Go back 15 years, there was no white or red Baltic in the country. Yeah. All that testing was done on radiator pine and slash pine. And yeah. so as that new material comes in, it's, it's on us to do, go and do the tests to make sure we're still um, performing correctly and things haven't altered. In some cases, it might have been the the bracket failed at a particular number of nails and now the nails are letting go. So we need to make sure that we keep up with that sort of stuff. Uh, and it's up to the, the manufacturers to do that so that everyone can be assured that what they're getting is the right product. And yeah. a lot of us go to a lot of effort to make sure that's right. We get independent certification to make sure that we have someone else saying, yes, you're doing the right thing. Um, we've checked that and we can make sure that that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, look, and I suppose, you know, just to, to back up that, that comment about um, it's sort of like the, the design elements that, that can impact on the connector. I mean, I suppose the classic one was, you know, Cyclone Tracy, where that really woke us up to the effects of, you know, the cyclones and the impacts on, on structures. And so that, that was all reviewed. And, I, and that's where, I suppose, even in 1684, all that sort of knowledge is then brought into the standard to make sure that everything is, is in alignment um, with, with the design codes and the loading, that the connectors are available. Uh, to, to be used in those environments. So, yep. all right then, Tim, um, thanks very much uh, for your presentation and I'll just close out today's webinar, but thank that's been very informative. So thanks a lot, Tim. You're welcome. So um, as I mentioned um, uh, from the outset, so today's webinar will be recorded and you can access uh, previous recordings on the Wood Solutions uh, website. As I mentioned as well, that you know, our, our um, Web, Wood Solutions webinars are held every every uh, two weeks. Um, next in the next fortnight, there's actually a um, there won't be a webinar because there's a, a timber offsite construction uh, conference that's being held on Tuesday 21st and Wednesday 22nd. So uh, the Wood Solutions uh, webinar won't be held in in two weeks' time, um, but there will be a webinar on the 28th um, of June and the topic uh, will be advised um, in, in the interim. So look, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and um, thank uh, Tim again, and uh, we'll see you soon.